Hey everyone, here we are. We are on the season finale of Level Up Enablement. I am not with Ashton today. She had to take some personal time, but I did happen to find two extraordinary people to join us today, Dave and Whitney. How are you guys? And uh, let's kick off some introductions. Dave, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I've probably met a lot of folks out there, but my name is Dave Lichtman. I run a company called Enable Match, and we are a recruiting firm that is hyper-specialized in sales enabled folks. So that means is people like all you um, find jobs to people like me because I'm helping companies find the, the diamonds in the rough, the really good enablement folks. And so I've, over the past two and a half years now, I've gotten to know so many enablement folks and I have, I think the best job in the world. Yeah, you you definitely had that on, that's great. And Whitney, you work for a, a company, I don't know if many people have really heard of it. I don't, I don't know. Tell us a little <laughs> oh, about <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitney Seek, and I'm Senior Director of Enablement at Outreach, which is the leading sales engagement technology, which is why many people who are in sales enablement have often heard of Outreach. And what I think is most exciting about this opportunity in particular is it's really this meta mission of enabling, you know, go to market teams that in turn go and enable go to market teams with our technology. And so that's been a really special part of, of joining Outreach. But I started my career in sales and sales leadership and really quickly found my passion for enablement and just have been relentlessly pursuing it ever since. Um, so I started in like consulting. I did my own my own thing for a bit, sales and customer service enablement, and then moved into uh, oil and gas because I was in Houston and I had either oil and gas or medical to choose from. Um, and that's what, what really got me to learn a lot of the best practices that when I moved into the SaaS space made me feel really comfortable in starting enablement teams from scratch. And so that's set me on this trajectory to, to land here at Outreach. Yeah, love it. Small journey for sure. You know, just, I can't, I can't even underestimate when you guys, you, we, you've heard us talk about her last week too. She was also featured in some of our extra content. So uh, yeah, we love it. Uh, today, like I said, we are going over a very special episode. It is the finale. We are talking about a few different things, but we're going to be talking about two roles particularly. Some may, some companies might have one, some companies may not. Depends on how you are structured. Again, very fluid in the enablement world on what positions are there. And then we're also going to land out on what is the future of the C-suite enablement profession. So without a doubt, let's jump into director versus uh, vice president, as well as the future. Welcome back. Here we are. Let's kick this off. So again, very round table open. I don't care who starts out. Rock, paper, scissors for the first uh, call out if you want. But uh, let's let's clarify what is the director and then what is the VP of enablement? I think I, I'll start us off with what I know. And I'm excited to learn from Dave in this conversation as well, right? Because I only know from my own experience and I'm happy to share that, but I'm excited to hear more about what's happening in the industry. The way that I think about the difference between director and vice president is similar to how we treat our personas that we teach our sellers about. So when you think about, you know, managers and practitioners of enablement, they're really focused on the day to day where directors start to focus on some of the strategy to achieve those corporate objectives and institute processes to scale and grow. Where a VP comes in is that extra layer of long term vision for roadmap of success and motivating and inspiring some of that change within the business. So I think they really set that foundation for momentum is that next level. Um, the, something that's similar though, is that both really own those core executive elements. They own strategy, people, process, systems, metrics. And what's unique about enablement leadership roles is that you have to not only see the forest, but also see the trees. Um, and I think that you know, it's not just strategy, but it's tactics and how we do that. Enablement does a really great job of bridging that gap. And that's why execs really view us as these important partners, because we don't just focus on the why and talk philosophically about how to get something done. It's the how. We, we lose relevancy if we don't focus on that how portion. And I think that's what really sets enablement leaders up for like unique success within an organization. I love that. I love the uh, forest and tree analogy too. Like it's a very in-depth point of view. Dave, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, I think everything you said is, is absolutely spot on. And 
And I, and I think if you think about this from a longer term perspective, it, it's, it's evolved. Enablement as a function and a, and a senior role has evolved from five, 10 years ago. And you really wouldn't find many, definitely not VP level enablement folks 10 years ago. They, they were very, very, very rare. And now you're seeing more of them. It's still not the norm, but, but they're happening more, more frequently. And I, I, I will add, I, I think she made a great distinction between the managers and the, in the sort of individual practitioners versus the directors and VPs. I think she's spot on of strategy versus tactics. I think that, that's exactly right. I will say the line between director and VP or senior director and VP is very blurry. And I've been into a lot of, you know, when I'm helping companies hire for these roles, sometimes it's basically a coin toss. And I'm only slightly exaggerating as I say that as well. It depends what the person's done before, but the role is what the role is. And so we may upgrade the title to get the right person, but, but it's the same role. And, and conversely, like I've even, I was talking to last year and they were, it was, a, it was this higher enablement leader plus one person beneath them. They're like, we're gonna call it a VP. And I'm like, that seems kind of extreme for the size of your company and the size of the enabled organization maybe directors more right and like no we want to attract top talent and have the right title and because we're, we're fast growing we want to get the best people and all that's admirable but this is my way of saying the titles are very fungible they're and they're very blurry and that's neither good nor bad it just is where we are as we're evolving from this this very tactical function to this very strategic function yeah and and for anybody that's watched the entire series through like we've talked about enablement being very fluid some teams may have one person and they may be only a specialist or a manager or, you know, a director. And then however it may be different sizes of different teams and different companies all have different titles throughout all of that. I think that's spot on. So Dave, I'm going to start out with you first and then Wendy will jump back into you, but let's talk about like, where does the director VP sit within the org? So you, you touched on this a little bit, a company might not have that director VP position right away when is it appropriate to bring that in or how does that fit in into the overall structure of the team? So um, when's it appropriate to bring in a director or enablement in general? Director or VP of, yeah, of enablement. Yeah, I, I think it, it depends on how they view the function. So, so some companies view it very tactically. And you're going to go there and you're going to execute our vision. You're just going to go and do stuff and do, do your enablement stuff. And that to me is manager level. Like you're executing someone's vision and you're just, you're training and you're doing all that very tactical stuff. And to Whitney's point from before, when they view it strategic, strategically, when they want to embrace this person and pull them into their Monday morning meetings, when they're a direct report of a CRO, that's when all of a sudden you have a seat at the table, both literally and figuratively, and your voice matters on the strategic things. And you are, you are embraced very deeply by the leadership team. That's when it becomes very director plus in terms of its level. And so if, if a company's thinking like, I need my person to help us scale and, and help be my the extension of me as a CRO, that's director level stuff. If you're looking like, I got a product playbook and everybody doesn't know our pitch yet. So it's amazing to come in and, bring, and make them do that. That's, that's not quite there. So it's a big function of, of the head of revenue and how they plan to use the function. Awesome. Whitney. Yeah. So for yeah. me personally, right? So I'll, I'll talk about where I sit within an org. Um, in a previous role, I was at a smaller company. And so I reported directly to our CEO. And the reason for that was that I helped to bridge the gap for the first time between sales and customer success by forming revenue enablement. And so it didn't make sense for me to favor one leader or another. And we didn't have a true chief revenue officer at the time. Um, so that's what elevated my role to reporting to the CEO. And then now I report to a chief revenue officer with Anna Baird at Outreach, who is such an incredible mentor and has such an awesome background that I'm learning so much from every day. Um, and it's so helpful to report directly to the chief revenue officer because I hear about the true challenges in the business. I help to hear the cross-functional impact 
of some of these challenges so that I've got a really clear scope on how to navigate with my team to help to solve some of those issues. And so it's like a chessboard, right? And now I at least have like the true vision, like Queen's Gambit style by working with the chief revenue officer. Um, so that's that's where I see it fitting into the organization. And I, I love it, right? Like you'll also hear from other people, there's um, other enablement roles that report through operations. and. For me personally, I've just seen a lot of those fall into that trap that Dave talked about earlier of being a little bit more reactive to someone else's vision with it. And enablement is really effective if you give us a lot more freedom with the strategy um, to solve challenges. So that's the difference, I think, in my mind. And to, to piggyback on that point regarding mm -hmm. reporting structure, I, I think she, she's spot on. And I always think that there is no right or wrong. Right, I just think optimal and maybe suboptimal, more effective. And I'll tell you a quick story. There is um, a director, senior director, enablement person I've, I've worked with over the years. And when I first talked to her, she was reporting up to a VP of, of sales operations. And I was talking to her about our job and her role. And she's like, this is great. Like, I love my job. I'm doing some really cool stuff. And, and she was super happy. And I asked the question, so you were up to VP of ops who, who reports up to the CRO. When was the last time you met with your CRO? And she was like, been about a quarter or two. And I was like, oh, that, that, that's a long time. And so I said, you might want to try and get in front of your CRO a little, a little bit often, just trust me. And so we kind of left it there. And fast forward, I talked to her probably six or so months later. And she said, oh, by the way, my, my head of ops left the company. They've moved me under the CRO directly. I said, oh, how is that now? And she's like, Oh my God. And she said, I, I thought I knew what was going on in the company. I thought I was plugged in, but like I am now part of every strategic initiative out there. Whenever there's a big problem, I, my opinion is asked. Whenever there's a big initiative, my, my opinion and strategy is asked. I'm, and she used the phrase, like I'm the sort of de facto chief of staff for the CRO. And so she's like, I, I'm, I'm so integrated in every single thing and I would never have it any other way. And so just seeing the same person in the same company with two different reporting structures really highlighted what, what, what Whitney was just saying of like how you're so plugged in, you're, you're ingrained with the organization and not playing this game of telephone from CRO to operations to you, like it, it, it matters. And so these aren't always things within our control, but I always think again, optimal versus suboptimal. If you can report up to a head of revenue, it's almost always your best bet. I, I'm speechless. I love it. I think I've, in my experience, yeah, I've done both. I've reported up to RevOps. Whitney knows the challenges there. Dave, you and I have talked about that too. And then, yeah, same thing. Uh, now that I'm with CRO, it's it's game changing. Like it's it's literally a breath of fresh air. Um. All right, let's jump into this. This is kind of the fun thing. Whitney, I'm going to kick it off with you because I know you're more recent in this journey. And Dave, I know that you can follow up because you know you're you're constantly searching for this top talent. But what is the skill set or experience that somebody is looking for? Uh, or that you need to provide or, or have when you're going in, in for these roles? Yeah, so interesting, right? Because you were talking about my role right now. So I'll, I'll tell you about some things that I think make me successful in this role. And then <laughs> Dave, you can share what, what others are looking for at scale. But um, I think that something that has been really helpful in my career is the level of business acumen. So being able to understand the real complex scope and the SaaS business model um, has been crucial for me in my leadership roles. I think systems thinking is another uh, skill set that I find really valuable where you're not just solving with like duct tape and glue the way that most startups do. You know how to do that. You can do the work around, but you also look at it from a lens of like, how do we fix it forever? And that's what really helps take us to the next level. Um, and then the other side is around experience, right? Like experience lean, leads to best practices, um, especially in our space right now where not a lot of those are defined. So I think experience has led to best practices and experience leads to avoiding potential pitfalls. I think that's probably where I add the most value to my team is, you know, helping to mitigate some of that risk that I can foresee them experiencing because I've been in their shoes and lived that life before. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind for me, top, like top of mind. But interested to hear if there's some other uh, core elements that were missed. Um, as always, I agree. And the <laughs> last point I'll even add, the something always surprised me when I, when I started this a couple of years ago, you know, if you have a person who's been in enablement for 10 years at a big company, call it like a Salesforce or Cisco or wherever, people actually want 
people who've been at different companies for a diversity of experience. So I, it's not just, I know one flavor of enablement. I know multiple flavors in different industries, different sizes, different levels of, of, of sales support. And so the diversity of experience to, to Whitney's point, it gives you, you've kind of seen a lot more stuff and you know how to avoid those pitfalls. So that's, that's one thing. The thing I, I'll tell you, when, when I talk to enablement candidates and sometimes people who have been fired from their jobs or people who have maybe been ineffective in their job, when, when, I, when I peel back the onion a few layers and hear kind of what was going on, more times than not, the, the, the fatal flaw or their Achilles heel is they're not building relationships. And it sounds like touchy feely stuff, but I promise you it's not. And there, there are people who are enablement practitioners who kind of do it in the ivory tower. They like, they kind of go off and they do their enablement stuff and they throw it over the fence and say, all right, you're enabled. And enablement is a team sport and you have got to be integrated with the sales organization intimately, deeply, such that they trust you, you trust them, you know what's going on and, and vice versa. There's a really solid relationship. And when we're talking about you know, director level, head of or higher VP level enablement people, that person is the face of enablement to operations, to the sales organization, to finance, to and so on and so forth. And if you can't build relationships, it, it inhibits your ability to be effective in your job. And so again, the people who struggle or fail in this job are the ones who haven't taken the time to build relationships. And I, and I can tell you story after story, if we had more time of people who get in there and they're highly competent at building programs all that stuff, but they haven't invested in the relationships with their CRO or whomever. And it comes back to haunt them very, very quickly. So I, I would say that's one very big thing that it's, it, it's overlooked. And so I always say like, if, if, if relationships aren't your natural skill set, either you've got to double down and fake it and sort of do what feels unnatural to you because it's part of the job, almost like an actor is in a role and that's how they have to act or, or just maybe rethink, is this really what you want to do? Because it's, it's a hard road to hoe if you're not building relationships. And Dave, another tactical way to achieve that, because I agree that's so important, is to build out an operating rhythm for yourself so that you do have those constant touch points. Because if you're not necessarily like a natural relationship builder, if you work it into your process, then it's something that exists that's there that will happen over time. Yeah, I agree. Amazing tips. I love that. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. One thing I'll add, and this, this will sound like a silly statement, but I, I promise you it's not. People who understand that enablement is a means towards an end, not just the end. And so what I mean is you don't go do a certification just to do certification. It's, it's time. You do it because you're there to drive a metric or an outcome. And the connection of I do this to achieve that, it's, it's, it's not the way a lot of enablement folks think. And when they go into an interview, they're not, they're not framing their experiences and their accomplishments in terms of X drove Y, it means to an end. And that's a big miss. And so again, I, I would have that, that frame of reference of, you want me to do something, what are you trying to achieve? How do we measure that? What's our baseline? What do we expect to achieve? And think that way. And again, this is, it's a means to an end. They're like, Outreach hires Whitney because she can drive their results. Not because she did some cool stuff in her past that looks really great on a resume. She can drive the results. That's what they have to, you have to, how you have to think about our work. That's how you have to convey it to people. I love that. And you're already uh, jumping ahead into that next topic there, Dave. So uh, kick us off here. But no, you're good. <laughs> uh, let's talk about like the interviewing. How, how do you go through that interview process? And on the flip side, what are we looking for? Um, if we were, if somebody was to hire for that director of VP level. Yeah, I will tell you, you know, I, I've seen so many interesting things that are, have been illuminating in terms of interviewing for enablement folks. I, I've seen people who are on paper and in their experience, extremely, even overqualified. Like they, they are, they could go in there and they should basically, they should have been walk in the park to get a job. And they go in there and they interview and they don't get it. And conversely, I've seen people who have been the underdogs, the least experienced people on paper and in, in, in reality, and they go and interview and they blow them away. And I'll tell you that the, the, the fundamental difference is how you talk about your experiences. So just, if you walk, if you're in the door, just assume you're, you, you, you are in the arena, 
you have a good shot at it. And so now at this point is how do you, how do you convince them? How do you prosecute the case that you can go there and drive change? And what I find is people go in there with these lackluster stories of, I tell the same example all the time because I think it's, it's just so commonplace of like, I joined the company, the onboarding program was terrible. So I went in there and I made it better and now it's world-class. And they're like, pat me on the back, look how great I am. And that's, that's, that's not telling a story that is epic, that's compelling, and that's memorable. And I, this whole video I, I made last year about like making your stories epic. And so like for everything that you've done, you need to say, talk about, here was a problem we had in the business and really go deep on the problem, paint the picture vividly and go really deep on like, here's why it was a big, bad problem. People were losing their jobs. Like it was, it, the business was really suffering, like really dive into the problem statement and then to talk about what you did and then what happened and have an arc to that story. But people are going in there with good experiences who should get jobs and they're not because they're not, they're not framing their experiences in such a way that people are like, whoa, I want that person, come do that here. And so I, I think understanding what your experiences are and how to tell them properly in a very compelling, epic way is, is essential. And people are, are not doing that. And the phrase I always say is, people are not getting credit for their work because they're not, they don't know the stories they want to tell. They haven't practiced telling them and they don't really know what details to bring in and what details to leave out. That's, that's amazing. Wendy, do you want to share your uh, tips and tricks on how you landed your uh, director job, senior director job? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I mean, a lot of them I actually learned from Dave, right? Like Dave came to a sales enablement society event. So I definitely love the concept. I call them impact stories, but like documenting those as you go, not just when you're preparing for an interview and socializing those wins internally when you close out a program is crucial to like not only set you up for success for your next role readiness, but also to prepare for those types of interviews. I'd say that when I've interviewed for, you know, director roles in particular, one thing that I'd encourage other folks is like, don't be afraid to challenge the status quo. Um, with my last role, I whiteboarded what I wanted my role to be. And so that was a very different experience. I sat with their senior VP of sales. We whiteboarded what, what I thought were my strengths and what I would saw as a, um, what world-class enablement could look like at the company. So I would say conduct sufficient discovery during your interview process. So you're acutely aware of the pains that that organization is experiencing. So you can share examples on how to solve them and frame your stories in the right way, the way that Dave described there too. Um, love the idea around outcomes focus, right? Like that is absolutely what needs to be demonstrated. Um, and then to hit back on an earlier answer, right? We talked about relationships being important. So make sure that some of the examples that you share highlight cross-functional prioritization. I feel like that is such a big skill set of these director VP roles in navigating the org. And so hearing where you had challenges with other teams, not just the one team that you're working closely with, but like other teams, downstream impact, that seems to be um, really helpful and relevant in the process. The last advice is, um, is less around like interviewing for a net new role, but also thinking about internal promotion and building your own business case for it. So for me, I don't think about promotion as necessarily a goal that I'm looking to achieve, but an outcome of performance measures that we've set for the enablement function. And so I think that that's a really important lens to look through when you're looking for your next level. Um, and then the other side is be a role model, not only for your organization and your team, but also for the industry and the community. So build your personal brand, um, shift perception and instill passion and definitely leverage your network when it comes to ideas on how to do that, because there's a lot of us who are, who are living the life right now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. I want, I want to piggyback, I always piggyback on her because she makes me think of new things that, I, that are so relevant. Um, so one, one big thing that I see a lot, and this sort of crosses, kind of, the answer kind of crosses a lot of stuff. What, what I also see a lot of times is I get the feedback from a CRO or VP of sales that a, an interviewee comes in there and the person's very, very, very qualified. And they walk away and says, you know, I talked to the person and they gave some very academic theoretical answers, but can they do the job? And, and that is a, a, that's a catastrophic situation when the person in fact can do the job in their sleep, but they didn't prosecute that case. And so my, the, the coaching here and what I would recommend to think about is when you're giving answers, you start out up here talking high level, 
but then you, you need to go down and go into more specifics. And the gold is in the specificity. And so if you keep your answers up here, theoretical, like I want to come in here, I want to onboard the whole program, make it a better onboarding situation for the company. So you're all able to ramp faster. All accurate, but that's up here. So get tactical for a moment, go, go into the specifics. What does that look like? How does that change things? Like get into the details because otherwise you sound like you're at a college course and you're like, it's all very academic and it's, it's just, it's not really what you can do. Or maybe you, you hired people to do it for you, but you don't really know the details. And so I, I would, my, my coaching for people is the, the gold is in the specificity. And so you can start out up here. That's the right place to start and then dip down with examples. And to Whitney's point from a second ago, she made the, the amazing point of when you close out a program, like talk to people, socialize and get some feedback. What that will also allow you to do is get some anecdotes, some quotes from people like, wow, this is how it affected me on my biggest deal I closed this quarter based on what you just did. You'll get these little nuggets that when you're interviewing, you get to use them. And you don't get to, and again, that's, that's, the, that's the specificity, right? You have these quotes and these anecdotes and things that really happened that you can bring into the conversation that add color to the answer. And people are like, whoa, their sellers must like them. And they, it really starts to paint a really vivid picture of you. But if you don't take the time, like Whitney said, to kind of socialize your program and get more details, you're not going to have the, 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 the enough you know, colors in your crayon box to paint the right picture here. I love that. I mean, even in my most recent QBR, I broke the format and I had a whole slide that said the way that people are talking about enablement is changing because that was a perception shift that was really important to my CRO when hiring for my role. So um, it wasn't the data that, you know, everyone else was sharing. It was a little fun break, but having those quotes really made everyone smile and recognize that things are different. So love that. If you are looking for any hiring advice or interviewing advice, this is the episode to watch this right here. I can honestly attest between Dave and Whitney, both coaching me through my interview processes recently. It's gold. Like you have to use it, apply it, apply it, apply it. Let's uh, you guys seriously phenomenal. I need to take a quick break. Like you guys have been killer. I love this. Let's switch some roles. Whitney, you started this out. You went on to the next topic now. So let's jump to it. But you talked about when you're interviewing, don't look at just what you're interviewing for, but where and how can you grow within that company as well too? So at, after that direct senior director level or that VP level, like it's hard to know exactly what is that next step. And I know one of the things that you and I have talked about is that C-suite position. So let's talk about this. Let's jump into where enablement fits on that C-suite board. And first of all, what is the name uh, of the C-suite? Is it defined yet, Dave? Do you know? Or Whitney, do you guys know what that's called yet? I haven't seen anyone with this role yet, but I like to think of it as the new CEO, the chief <laughs> enablement officer. Love so it. the the reason like it came to me was um I actually watched Mary Shea speak at Sales Enablement Pro Soiree, the the Sales Enablement Soiree a few years ago, and her topic of conversation was the future of enablement is in the C suite, and it was that presentation that really like got the wheels spinning that this is a long-term career for me. This isn't something where like eventually I'll have to jump to like be a leadership leadership role within a sales organization. Like I can stay here and grow legs under this and have this really be that strategic function that's going to make me feel like I'm making an impact in an organization um, because impact is my love language. So like I want to continue to like keep growing on that. Um, and so that's that's where I think it's headed. And I think that it's it's probably going to be some combination. We're dreaming here for a bit, Matt, right? Like when I looked course, up, like, yes. when I looked up on LinkedIn, I didn't see any roles like this. So I'm, I'm excited to hear from Dave if there is something that you've seen, but I think it's going to be some combination of like, you'll have to take on more than just go to market enablement, whether that's adding in like the customer and partner enablement or L and D as well. Um, there's been roles like chief learning officer that just focuses on the learning side. I think that the difference between learning officer and enablement officer is connecting to results, connecting to outcomes and being, being able to demonstrate the impact of those initiatives on behavior change and ROI. And so that's where I think the shift is going to happen. And it may be some combination of those, but I think that that's how you grow to like that, that C-level role. Dave, we're, throw us your two cents on this one. Yeah, I mean, and I, I agree that this doesn't exist today. And I don't know 
how soon it will exist. But what the shift I think we will see in the short to medium term is whether or not you are part of the C-suite, what, what I care more about is the influence, the effect of enablement on the C-suite and it being on their radar. And what I'm, so again, whether or not we were literally a C in front of our title or not, I think it, like Whitney at her last role, report up to the CEO, like you said before, that's influence. So the so enablement is on the CEO's radar in a very big way. And I, a couple of things I've been working on in the past couple of months where during the, the search to fill these roles, the, the enablement role itself has become upgraded because the this, this, this C-suite has decided, oh, this is more strategic, let's broaden the purview and or let's raise the level of the thing because this is strategic. And so what I'm seeing is enablement is, is a topic of conversation with them and one that they're realizing it, it's, it's strategic, we need to use this better and bigger than we originally imagined. And so mid-flight, it's sort of, they're, they're, they're changing it. And so whether or not we get the title, what I am seeing is more influence, being more on the radar and more, more strategic than it ever has been before. That is phenomenal. What did you have more? Well, I, just in addition, right? Like, I think that this is one of those things where I do see us potentially having this in our future. And I think that one big gap that exists right now that we'll need to solve for in order to solidify a strategic role like this is data strategy. Um, I think that it's really crucial here. The board needs to be interested in enablement's impact on the revenue strategy for them to want to include us at that seat at the table, right? Um, and so there was this concept that I was exploring with the board at uh, Greenhouse, my previous role, where it's taking the concept of customer lifetime value, but applying it to the employee lifetime value and actually being able to quantify, you make early impact and ramp, like what does that have on their long-term trajectory and their retention even within an organization? And so there's a lot of shift that has to happen to make like maximizing human potential, something that's talked about over revenue potential. Um, so I think that the, the data strategy is gonna help with that shift. Uh, but the last thing that I, I want is for this to become like a fluff role. We've already el eliminated enablement from being like a, a fluffy, you know, <laughs> soft fun. Like, yes, we're fun, but we produce results. And so like the last thing that I want is for this to be like, do y'all remember when I think it was like receptionists started being called like director of first impressions? Like, I don't want, I don't want a cutesy name just for the sake of having a cutesy name. Like I want to make sure that they see the impact and the results of the function. Yeah. And, and to that point, the, the, the beauty of, of sales or revenue enablement, whatever you want to call it, it, it's, it's measurable, like Whitney was saying. And that's, that, that's, that's a great thing. And so when you're in this world, like you're, you have accountability and it, it's sometimes very black and white and that's good. And I think when you start to broaden the role even to, to learning, it's, it's cool because you have a bigger impact, but you're also, you can potentially dilute your uh, discernible value to the organization. To Whitney's point, it's, you don't always know how well you affect a customer success, or a, um, a customer support person, or a person who works in, in in marketing, like it's it's not always as measurable. So there's a potential to dilute dilute perceived value, and that's that's a tricky thing. And so I, I, I like broader purviews, but just know that if you if you take on a bigger thing, you must have a way to have the accountability, like you do in your revenue oriented role. That I love that. Yes, and. You guys just literally knocked out the entire section out of the C uh, C suite enablement officer, and I love this. It's great. Like this is huge content. What? Uh, let's uh, close out with some final thoughts here. Like over any part of enablement, specifically the director of VP, future state, whatever it would be. Whitney, let's uh, kick off with closing thoughts. Sure. I think my closing thoughts are you know, focus on the data strategy so that you can tell those impact stories, right? Like I'm thinking backwards on our conversation here and we're talking about how important it is to demonstrate the value of enablement. Well, in order to do so, you need to set up the systems and structure to be able to report on those measures of success. So if you don't already have that in place from a repeatable perspective to start to set expectations on what types of results you'll deliver regularly, um, I would say start there. Awesome. Dave, yeah, the one thing that we haven't talked about today that I'll say as a closing thought is there, there are certain companies where enablement is valued, it's treasured, it's invested in, and certain companies where that's just not the case. And 
you know, it's a very different job if you're the first company versus the second type of company. It's, it's, it's vastly different. And, you know, really, if you're interviewing, like look for companies that are really investing in enablement. They believe in it wholeheartedly. They are, they're, the CRO is, is heavily, heavily invested in, in enablement. And that's, that's an important thing because if you're, if you arrive at these companies and all of a sudden it's very tactical and it's not, you don't have access, it becomes a very difficult, unpleasant job. And so interview them as much as they interview you and make sure this is a good place to do an case everywhere. We're, we're an enlightened crowd here. We all get it because that's because we're having these conversations on this, on this broadcast, but many, many companies, they don't think of it this way. And so just be cautious where you go and, and backdoor check, backdoor reference check them as they are probably backdoor reference checking you and make sure it's a good place. Uh, yeah, phenomenal. I could not have been any more happier with today's podcast to bring you two on for the finale of this season for uh, Matt Chats on Level Up. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Whitney. Again, check out Whitney and Dave's profiles on LinkedIn. If you're in the job hunt for anything enablement, check out Dave from Enable Match. He will definitely get you in the right direction, work with you on finding that next position or finding that next candidate as well. And then, of course, the wonderful Senior Director of Outreach, Miss Whitney Seek. Again, check her out on her social platforms as well, too, as the Enablement Enthusiast, where she provides great impacts, customer stories, and she's also doing some side hustle for some mentoring. So if you want a little bit more, uh, check her out. She's definitely a, a great asset and tool in my toolbox and has helped me tremendously, as well as others down the road as well. Whitney, Dave, thank you both so much for uh, joining us today. I appreciate it so much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Oh, 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 oh